Eu sou Mauricé Pimenta Tani. I'm a Kaisar from São Gonçalo Beach, and I'm a Kaisar. I have ancestral ties to the Kaisar people. It's bio me here where I'm walking. It's very close to Parachi. It's my territory as well. That we, as the traditional people, the Kaisar people, it's one territory. The walls and fences mean nothing to us. They came with real estate speculation. So we use the territory in a continuous sense. Wherever I am, I will recognize the leaves. I know the leaves. I know what they're used for. I know how to identify the leaves. And this is something which came to me, passed down through oral tradition. I used to collect medicinal herbs for my grandmother, and she helped me pick them. I was too small to really understand, but my grandmother taught me basically this land is the opportunity for maintaining knowledge, ancestral knowledge. I realize that this here is resistance and memory when you have an environment where you can manage, you can plant, you can harvest and identify things, smells and textures, it's memory. When we are able to keep people here on the land, it's a war that we need to wage access to land, access to the forest, access to water, for example. It's a this territory in dispute. I bathe my soul in the forest. 
I cleanse my soul in the forest. I feed from the forest. Mauricea Pimenta, social activist and member of the Women's of the Land Collective. Women of the Land is basically an organization of women, Kaisara women, based on our ancestral legacy here in Angra dos Reis and Parachi. It's a women's organization, organizing women to conquer a place of speech. So when these women, these families lose their land or access to land, they can have the knowledge survive there and present there. This was the reason for women of the land to organize precisely to maintain the opportunity to listen and to speak. The women resist day by day. And that's part of the mystery and enchantment of all this. Ministério do Turismo e Associação Casa. The Ministry Casa... of Tourism and the Casa Azul Association present the 19th FLIP, the Parachi International Literary Festival, a project benefiting from the federal law for incentives for culture and Vadi culture. Official sponsorship by Itaú Bank and the Vadi Cultural Institute. FLIP is organized by the Casa Azul Association, the Special Secretary of Culture under the Ministry of Tourism. Yeri Gera. Literature and plants, naturalism and violence. Leaves and verbs, plants and cure, fungi, technobotanies, threads of words, utopia and dystopia, this round table will last approximately one hour and was pre-recorded. Thus, there will be no time for questions from the audience. The internet broadcast is via three channels, the original audio, Portuguese, and English. Please choose the language of your preference. Trees and writing. Good evening. I want to greet the audience who are attending the 19th and historical flip in 2021 made a daring wager with this plant turnaround in the literary field. I'm Ligia Ferreira, a professor in the course of literature in the Federal University in Sao Paulo. And it's a huge satisfaction to chair this roundtable, who which features two acclaimed and two loved writers who are going to talk with us about trees and writing. And today, uh, there are several different layers of Portuguese speaking countries, Mozambique and Brazil. So I want to introduce Paulina Chizian, who was born in Majaca, Gaza, from a family where they spoke Shopi and Ronga languages. At six years of age, she moved to Maputo and learned Portuguese in a Catholic school. She studied linguistics at the Eduardo Mondrande University. She was an activist in Freire Lima, the Mozambique Liberation Front, during her youth before she dedicated her work full-time to writing and publishing her work. She's a fictionist, publishing short stories in the press, and her writing since then led to controversy in women's situation, women's leadership in a patriarchal society, after which, after the independence of yeah, Mozambique in 1975 came the Civil War until 1992. And during this period, Paulina published her first novel, The Ballad of Love to the Wind, which is also the first novel by a Mozambican woman where she discusses polygamy in 
her country, a theme that a re-emergence in her novel, the most famous novel, Nikechi, the First Wife, A Tale of Polygamy. She received awards from the Association of Mozambican Writers, the first of a series of awards. Paulina is also a poet, and she launched the Song of the Enslaved in Nyandala. She is uh, the most extensively translated Portuguese-speaking writer in 2021. As she knows, she became the first African writer to receive the Camões Award for her life's work. Good evening, Paulina, and welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much indeed. I miss Brazil. Saudade. It's an um, awesome country, although the problems at the end of the day, despite the difficult moment uh, with COVID-19, I'm still an optimist and I would love to embrace you. And and I'm, it's wonderful to hear news from you. And here in Brazil, we have in Salvador, Bahia, where we're connected to Sao Paulo, Maputo and Salvador. It's a wonderful triangle. So we have here the young author acclaimed as one of the main revelations of contemporary Brazilian literature, Itamar Vieira Jr. He was born in Salvador and he has a BA, a BA and master's from the university in Bahia in ethnic African studies with his thesis on being in the struggle. The Yuna people on the formation of Quilombola communities in the hinterlands of the Northeast of Brazil. He's also an employee of INCRA, the National Institute for uh, Agrarian Reform. And he produces where he works with academic work with feeding his literary creation. He premiered in 2012 with a book of short stories that he won several awards for in 2017. The um, Hangman's Prayer won awards in 2018, his consecration with the Crooked Plow, which won the Leia Award in Portugal, and also here, Oceanos and Jabuti in Brazil and Portugal. He was acclaimed for the robust creation in his narrative, the way that he addresses uh, the emphasis on female characters violence on their bodies in a patriarchal society and this reality that he shows us of social oppression 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 by men over women and this narrative with universal contours as the jury in the portuguese speaking award approach itamar vieira junior to paulina shiziani good evening Ligia. good evening paulina and it's a huge pleasure to be here with you sharing this round table it's great, it's wonderful to be able to hear this evening Paulina Shijani, Paulina who came, who is so loved in Brazil, and she's just received the Camões Award for the Portuguese speaking community. And we don't have the honor to have her with us. Well, we can't wait to welcome her to Brazil. So I'm gonna ask my first question for Paulina. Paulina, you always say, that you don't like to be called a novelist because you're a storyteller. You began to write under a tree. After all, right now you're sitting under a tree as of some news stories. When you see the news for the Camões Award, you're sitting under a tree in this place that must be your home. It's in your garden, surrounded by trees. But how does this play out? What kind of tree, or was that one where you were sitting when you received, when you began to write? Because we travel on your uh, stories in this tree around, it's a sacred tree now, right? The one where you started writing, and perhaps you may have a plaque on the tree, Paulina Shijani, where you began to write, uh, who won the Camões Award in 2021. Tell us about that, the tree under which you began to write. Okay, can you hear me okay? Hello? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. I, first, I would like to talk about the tree, the meaning of trees, the tree in the Mozambican culture and context. 
we as Africans normally we do prayers by a tree and prayers to the transcendental is done for a special reason. The tree is a being for us, the most perfect being, because there are three simultaneous dimensions. A tree has roots, which is under the ground, this sacred place called the earth where our ancestors sleep. So we have the trunk, which is our daily life, our day to day in society, and also the canopy of the tree with the tree's branches. So when I pray by the tree, I'm communicating with three different dimensions simultaneously. The past represented by the roots, the present, which is represented by the trunk and the sh shade and the transcendental represented by the branches. And when I uh, bring my hands together, my prayers are too short. So I have to ask help from the tree, help from the tree's spirit to raise my prayer to the transcendental. So this is one of the reasons that I normally uh, African goes, Africans go to formal churches to prayer on Sundays. And nevertheless, the most sacred moment in the life of an African, they come back to practice their prayers under the tree. There are many, many writings saying that Africans pray under trees because they don't want to go to church now. A perfect prayer is the one that is prayed under the tree. So here I am sitting under this tree with the prayers, speaking grammatically, of course, prayers in Portuguese. And there's no better place for me than under the shade of a tree. And when I received, the day I received the Takamonis Prize and I learned of it, I was sitting under an acacia tree, I think in Brazil. It's called Framboesa. It's a cool place. It was a very hot day. So I was sitting under, I have the bad habit, even when it's over 100 degrees in late afternoon, I like to watch the uh, kindle, kindling burning. It's a, when I was a girl, I was thrashed by my parents because I was wasting kindling and charcoal because they didn't win because at 67 years of age, I continue with the same habit of standing by the uh, wood fire. So the tree is a sacred place for me and under the trees, that's where I sit under the cool shade. And that's where I have my fondest memories. And I also noticed in the news stories that you were, when you received the news of the Camões Prize, I saw a bonfire at your feet and I was curious I said, I looked and said, She's must, it's not cold, but now you explained that you love uh, sitting by uh, wood fires as well and watch the kindling burn. Uh, it's a habit of mine. I can't, I can never get over this habit. Paulina, your book, The uh, Birds, it's a short story the swallows, you talk about the sacred tree, this triple dimension, because actually we are never separated from the past, present and future. In your book, the swallows, you talk about the use of the dead trees, how women see in landscape dead trees. So they are, I can't narrate this, but in a word, they are in out in the fields with the general who warns them that a dead tree could you explain this to us i'll ask itamar to comment on this as well that dead trees at least in the nadal's land is a land 
which is full of secrets because these dead trees, they have, they're almost like entities that flourish in nights, magic nights, but also give po the powers of resuscitation. And if you're fortunate enough to eat these fruits, these trees who feed us as well, they overcome death and darkness. So I'd like for you to comment on these dead trees, which are, in this case, full of these symbols, which are mentioned and described by you in this story, the swallows. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, without before we uh, ask uh, Itamar to come in, what I can say is that these are our beliefs concerning immortality, thus some groups, cultural groups here in Mozambique, they have this myth or belief that a dead tree is not dead because it resuscitates and it can still give powers to people. Myths and beliefs are beliefs. I like to explore beliefs as a way of preserving beliefs. This belief is very common or myth in the religions from the central Mozambique where they say that trees during day the day look dead but during the night the magical trees that of eternity we have countless myths that need to be collected preserved and disseminated great thank you so itamai it's with you talking about dead trees Concerning what Paulina just talked about, we think about dead trees, they have, they're lifeless, but I was moved and impacted when I heard this, and I'm happy to know that the belief in myth, thanks to you, Paulina, that the dead trees, I wanted to understand this and transfer this to Brazil. So I was looking at uh, Crooked Plow, your novel, and trees, where is the, when does the word tree appear for the first time in the crooked plow in the second page actually it's the dry trees the grandmother the main characters bibiana and bellonisi were talking and the last reference so the first reference are dry trees and the last reference to trees in crooked plow is when the jari cult said to if you unite to bellonisi's body to wander and cross through houses and dead trees in the crooked plow there's another story in this other one of your recent books i found dora Mai, the meeting of dora Mai and with the trees to rest from life so i'm tossing out these ideas here to, for you to comment a little bit about this uh approach and how this impacted you this word as the word tree which in portuguese is a, a feminine it's conjugated in the feminine and the force of nature that you identify in your female characters and it's a common point with what with what we just find in the work of paulina shijani okay fine Deja. i think that the trees appear in my writings in such an organic way that i didn't even realize that i was talking about trees in my writing i think that this idea that the world the world where the plots play out, the stories and tales, it's a living world. It's alive and vibrating. It's full of life. And this life is in everything, not only in the characters, but in the characters which we oftentimes don't, aren't capable of noticing or feeling. And I can quote numerous things, the shapes, the shapes and the contours, the stars and trees and plants. I didn't realize how many plants there were in the crooked plow, descriptions of plants and trees until I contacted the edition in Italian of the book, which had several, a glossary, even in this glossary, there are countless species of trees which are there as part of the story Buzero, the umbu trees 
dende palm trees, burichi palm trees. In other words, the trees appear constantly in dialogue with the characters, not just part of the landscape. Trees have life and they interact constantly. I loved hearing the explanation from Paulina Shijani for her relationship and her literature with uh, plant species and life as well, this uh, world view where in cosmo vision where trees are part of everything and plants are part of our world and our inner world. And having been born in Bahia, Lija, I learned since I was a young child to have this relationship, a deep relationship with nature. Here we had a contribution, a priceless as a contribution from the African diaspora for the cultural formation of our state and population. And for example, Candomblé doesn't exist without the plant species. There's even a saying in Yoruba, the Yoruba came in, uh, numerous Yoruba people came in the 16th and 17th and 18th century to Bahia. And this saying says, with you, Iwe, Kosi Oe, Kosi Orisha. In other words, without leaves, there are no Orishas. There's no divine, there's no connection between humans and what is beyond human, more than human. This is the way that the trees, that the plant species enter my writings and my story. Specifically, beyond the species that I listed here in the Crooked Plow, there is, I talk frequently about jare, this religious expression which only exists in the Diamantina mountain range for healing, spiritual healing, and the healing of the body of those characters. And this healing only takes place through the plant species, knowing the roots, knowing the leaves, the herbs that the healer can uh, produce the cure and healing and spread solidarity amongst those around him or her. We know that it's fascinating what you just commented concerning. You realized this, how the trees, the plants, they are all present and inhabit through translation. I'm also a translator myself, but I analyzed some correspondence. I don't know if Pauline, if there was this kind of contact with your translators, but do you have any correspondence? I saw a correspondence with a, of a writer, Guimarães Rosa, his experience with his translators, Guimarães Rosa. I'm French studies, I translate French, and he was very close to his translator in Guimarães Rosa and his Italian translator. It was precisely, it was all this, various different things, but this flora that caused this, how can I say, that led to this difficulty in the translation. And I would like to, for Paulina, afterwards I'll come back to Itamar, Paulina, we have in your book also, you talk about several different plants. You talk about the sacred plants, and the importance of these myths and beliefs here in the book. The uh, happy song of the partridge, you have a dialogue. It's almost a desafio, like uh, the challenge. Two characters talk about the uh, palm trees. Uh, one says, no, the palm trees are better. The coconut trees are almost like a relationship with work, but the palm trees is a symbol of freedom. And coconuts, like a plant, the coconut trees is something connected almost to work and obligation and enslavement. I would like for you to talk about, I thought that was fascinating, this dialogue 
between the two characters in these uh, nuts or coconuts in the palm trees as well as what you call this mythology that you would like to expound on and how you uh, use it in your work. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I could talk about so many things about trees, beginning by saying the following. When I am in Maputo, I write, the tendency is to have nature, the surrounding nature, in other words, uh, different kinds of trees and other plants. Concerning the palm trees, I wrote, I was in Zambezia, the Zambezian vegetation is built, it consists of palm trees. Zambezia used to have the largest palm tree grove in the world. I don't know why. I write my story and in, in nature, nature, in nature enters. I had an experience when I went to Namibia, which was a desert, a region called Onjivero. They have some scrawny little plants they're tiny it's a desert in namibia and even in the landscape there were just two colors the white from the sand and blue from the sea when later when i read the text i felt that at the end the greatest influence with greater force to be able to produce a text is the landscape it's nature that surrounds us I've been to so many places, and this is visible in my work, but concerning this aspect, I would like to go back to the Portuguese language. The Portuguese language is this language of mobility, of communication, but it is not the language of culture in Africa. It would be interesting to see some glossaries in botany. They talk about masala. Masala is a fruit which only exists here amongst us so I have to write masala in portuguese the word masala is so beautiful in our language but i in the glossary have to translate it by saying it is a fruit round but it is not and it looks like a coconut but it's not a coconut or not a round uh, fruit with a hard husk so this is masala the fruit masala with a tough husk we africans are oftentimes criticized by our translators because oftentimes we say the flowers the birds and we don't specify them and for it might like seem like linguistic incompetence the flowers that i have in my fauna and flora in the flora in mozambique i know them in the local language, but the Portuguese language does not describe them and name them because the Portuguese comes from a European culture and that doesn't penetrate and rarely penetrates into our African languages. So sometimes I love the Brazilians who appear, the names of the flora and the fruits and I say, what kind of fruit is this? I look, I get my Portuguese dictionary and I look for the definition of those fruits, but these fruits are characteristics of a certain region in Brazil. Talk about the fauna, the same thing, but this exercise for us as Mozambicans and speakers of Portuguese, we have to have the courage to say, I'm gonna uh, use our own languages spoken languages so, humankind without shade without fruit without the sap from the tree and without this spirituality and ancestral ties with the trees most of the healings the True healing comes from nature, from the leaves, the roots, and from the bark, well-being, psychological well-being of whatever. After a long work day, a tiring work day, it's sitting in the shade of a tree. That's why for us Africans, trees, all of the trees are sacred trees. All trees are sacred. And we have 
many myths, many beliefs, many truths as well around the trees. One of them is this. To cut down a cashew tree, it's necessary to kneel before it and ask permission to cut the cashew tree and justify and explain the reasons for felling the cashew tree. I have to plant a new cashew tree right afterwards. If you don't pray to cut down the cashew tree, the cashew tree will fall on the person's head and kill the person. At 67, six years of age, I haven't seen anyone who was killed by a cashew tree in an act of vengeance. I've never seen that. But this myth, when the children are taught from an early age, to, the trees have the same right to live as I. So if I have to cut it for kindling, I have to respect, I have to ask permission, and even to say, the prayers are very beautiful. It's simple as like this. Saint Cashew Tree, I ask your permission from your spirit to remove you from here. I don't mean you harm, but I have to uh, cook for the children of God. I don't know if the tree answers, but after you've cut down the tree and the modern world came with its technologies and machines and our myths were viewed as lesser myths and beliefs as superstitions. I don't care if it's true. A myth is always a myth, but it has its social function, which is preservation and respect for this environment that we have. I know that Brazil is one of the countries that's the wealthiest countries in terms of nature and natural resources. And it's very painful to see the modern world, what the modern world does, because when the last tree dies that day for me. The last bird will die and the last human being will die. If we want to live and survive, we have to live with the trees and respect them because without trees, we have no space and room for trees of the heavens to come. Paulina, I have a message in the chat box from one of our curators, Hermano Viana, saying that cashew trees went from Brazil to Mozambique. That's fascinating. Look, we have like a bridge in our Portuguese speaking communities in this tree, the cashew tree that you told us about the cashew trees. So came from Brazil to Mozambique. It's beautiful. So I would like to ask Itamar now, Itamar, I think that you had already made clear, obviously, the degree to which the we're more Africans than we believe here in Brazil, but we're also going back to your work, talking about the dimension of spirituality and how between Paulina and you will find these trees in these contributions mix and mingle. But I wish to say that there in the crooked plow, again, there's a moment when Bibiana says, Zeca Chapel Grande under the herbs and roots searching and Belenise said also that what she loved, unlike Bibiana, to do make oil and uh, peel buri, the burichi fruits. It's probably in your glossary from your Italian translator, but just to say that burichi is uh, the tree that's most cited in the uh, devil to pay in the backlands by Gimanais Haza in a story, a short story by Gimanais Haza, because this, I think, I think that you now enter into a lineage there. I apologize if I'm daring, like Euclides da Cunha, Gimanais Haza and Itamai and the backlands. But in this book, in Sagarana by Gimanais Haza, there's a character who's a doctor who comes to the hinterlands and the village in the hinterlands of Baye, and who looked down on the people of that village and their myths. He thought that they were foolish and like uh, quackery. And little by little, he learned to understand in the 
forest and especially uh, bamboo grove in the bamboo stand this bamboo stand you know this short story he realizes that bam the bamboo uh, this smooth he discovers that there is a an inscription there's a little plaque written on the bamboo there and he goes into the woods and he is marvels at this and he sees that there's an inscription he leaves an inscription on the bamboo some time goes by when he comes back there's an answer to him so there's back and forth and this answer is the story so it's in this story it's one of the stories that gimanais has it it's difficult for all translators because there are more than a hundred species of plants and flowers and trees in this sagarana but he says that they're at the stalk of the bamboo uh, flower bed of uh, this back and forth, this dialogue, the written dialogue, the doctor who had come there to visit this village. And they left inscriptions with this anonymous interlocutor in the bamboo stand. He already told us about the plant world and our brothers and sisters of the trees. What about this plant world? That which you find in your own uh, backlands. I'm talking with Itamar about this amalgam of a uh, geographer and writer. Lisa, I wouldn't be able, to, I knew that the devil to pay in the backlands cite Burichi. I knew that, but I didn't know that it was the plant species that was most cited, the Burichi palm tree. I think it is. It's probably the most frequently cited in the Crooked Plow. This region where this story takes place and plays out is a region. It's wet, humid, and there, there are a lot of species which depend on water to survive. They depend on this uh, wetland, the wetlands. One of them is the Burichi palm, but there's a dende red oil palm that appears for well, these species in Tortarad. But this is the point, how vegetation enters my literature and writing, how it enters my writing. First, that we as writers, and I think Paulina will agree, we are uh, giving testimony to our time and space as well, and bearing witness. And in this space, either in Brazil or Mozambique, to live in this space, it's the space where nature speaks very intensely and that this part of our life very intensely. I wrote a story which was published recently in an anthology called Ache Stories, where each Brazilian author was responsible for speaking of one Orisha. And I chose the or Orioko, the Orisho for time it's represented in this cosmology, this myth mythical cosmology as a tree. So the main character of this story is a tree. Oh, I, uh, it's a pity that I haven't read it yet. The tree grows and accompanying the story of the diaspora. In other words, the story begins with a tree, which was almost killed because the prune all the branches and in the urban space in Salvador, they pruned all the branches and a woman, a woman there is, feels so sorry for that scene that every day she goes sitting under that tree and begins to talk to see if that tree is reborn. Since I had to talk about this entity, which represents chronological time in addition to the fact that time is an entity itself. I didn't, couldn't find any other way is this literal representation of the tree. So this woman is in this time and the time traverses with the tree, the entire story. It begins with a woman who's captured in a village on the uh, Mina coast in West Africa. Before she was captured, she knew that her tribe was at war. Before she was captured, she takes a seed which 
mattress on the tree, which is the center of her village and her community. And she takes that seed and brings it to Brazil with her clothing. And in Brazil, that seed becomes a kind of amulet until one day it sprouts from the ground and other stories emerge from it. The story of a former enslaved person who goes to fight in the Paraguay war with the promise of being uh, emancipated and after Brazil wins the Paraguay war and he comes back home, he is not emancipated. And other stories emerge also from this species, this tree. And unwittingly, but looking with great reverence at this ancestral wisdom, which is part of our world view, this tree becomes a character and the tree that unites all the other characters telling the story of time. In Salvador, for example, Nisha, it is a city where we still, despite all the destruction which urbanization caused, but it's still possible to see a lot of gamela trees and gamela trees are this species which represent time, which represent the orisha, oroko, or time. And it's not uncommon for you to find oftentimes these trees surrounded with white cloth, these fig trees, their reverences and uh, worshiping that the population, especially the uh, people that in from Candoble for the fig tree, Gamelera, uh, they uh, envelop it with white cloth. So growing up in this space, in this environment was also essential for me to look at the plant species as sisters and sisters in this epic story, which is human life. And not coincidentally, they always emerge and reemerge in what I write. It is interesting, this story that reminded us of from Guimarães Rosa, and how Guimarães Rosa's work brings this vision very specific to the hinterlands, the Sertão, the hinterlands, which also are the backlands, who change constantly. I traveled extensively in the backlands in recent years, although I wasn't born in the backlands, but I traveled into the backlands numerous times. And it's amazing the, how the landscape changes, how it changes. During the dry seasons, you see the trees dry. They look like they're dead, but it's just the appearance because with the slightest sprinkle of rain, everything, uh, the leaves go green again. And kachinga, that means this scrub forest, which is white like bones, and gray where there's no green it sprouts again in such an intense green and such powerful green, this image of the Kachinga, the scrub forest, the backlands captivated me, this nature with this force, interweaving and intertwining in the characters that live in that region reverberated to such an extent that it was impossible to not talk about plants, about trees, about this, plant world that surrounds us and that is under such jeopardy. Yes, now I'm going to ask a question for both, as was suggested here, for Paulina, the wisdom comes frequently from women, storytellers, storytellers of these history that they lived in a very special way in Itamar, according to what you said, Bibiana and Belonisa are heirs of knowledge from their father. The, in the, that they go into the woods and learn about roots. Their father was a healer. So it would be great if both could talk briefly about, because unfortunately the round tables 
come to an end someday. But very quickly, if you could talk about this place of the feminine in relation to the knowledge of trees and everything. But the question that they're asking is, listening to plants or trees when you're a woman, do you listen better to trees and plants when you're a woman? Paulina, could you answer that first? I was going to begin by talking about human vanity when the Europeans invaded us and said that everything that we do is superstition. It's a lesser people, inferior people, but our traditions, our African traditions, and even the Brazilian trans, uh, traditions today teach us to be fine with nature. In other words, I read a lot about the indigenous peoples of Brazil, and there's so many similarities to the Africans. Our beliefs are demonized, called inferior. Our prayers before we cut down trees were called superstitions. They brought the powerful machines and they began to fell and destroy everything. And fine, of what I have in my memory since my childhood, the great lesson is this. I'm going to repeat it now. When the last tree dies, the last human will die. So there's, it's impossible and unthinkable, this destruction. And uh, we acknowledge that the destruction of nature is a very serious issue. But now we can also talk a little bit about this concept of uh, paradise and hell and others have demonized. We Africans have our paradise on the ground. That is, why do I have to look for paradise in the stars when there aren't any trees or shade or even sand to uh, hold the plant in place under my feet? So the concept of paradise for us is under the shade of a tree. That's why our prayers are under trees, because trees bear these three dimensions simultaneously. And looking at practical issues, I say, what a pity that the world that was purportedly modern with solutions, all mankind's problems, they thought that they owned the world and they practiced this widespread destruction, which now has begun to affect the entire planet. And going back and recalling my experience in the desert, suddenly I had a headache. I was depressed. I didn't know what was happening. I went to a doctor, even in Namibia, and the doctor in Namibia said something like, it was anxiety, he said. But what kind of anxiety? I was eating fine. I was uh, well comfortable in my hotel. So where was this malaise coming from? I hadn't realized that I wanted to see greenery. There was the blue sky and there was the white sand, but there was no green there to uh, soothe my eyes. I took uh, some medicine to get by with my headache but I didn't have to go in, into major treatment. But when I left Namibia and when we were flying over South Africa, all the symptoms disappeared. So when I actually, what I actually learned from this is that nature is extremely important. It's crucial. And it's something that I would like to underline. Nature doesn't need to be human to survive. Human beings need nature, not the other way around. So how can human beings say, I am the master i can cut down do whatever i want with nature and it would be a pity for the modern world to destroy this paradise that brazil has because it's a paradise isn't that true there's no other paradise but other than the ground that we 
stand on and the shade that we rest under. So my relationship with nature is deep. I don't have an awareness of this, but it's but when I'm in the green or in the desert or in a beautiful landscape, my inspiration comes from that because I am nature myself. So I have no right to eliminate that nature that supports me because without it, I can't live. Nobody can live without trees. The trees can do without me, but I can't do without the trees. Paulina, I learned that you have have come to Brazil several times, Belo Horizonte, Rio, São Paulo, and Salvador, of course, Natal, Curitiba, and other cities of Brazil, from north, south, east, west of Brazil. You were in universities, our centers for African presents, that is the partnership, I wanted to Ninjalo, the publishing house here, and you talk, I would like for you to talk about the landscape that struck you in Brazil. I would like to know, Itamar, you have, have you been in Africa and specifically in Mozambique? No, I haven't yet. This is a gap that I have to deal with as soon as the pandemic allows, but your books, your books are reaching the places in Africa, in Angola and Mozambique. They've circulated, but not in their own editions in each of these countries, but they've circulated there. My And the crooked plow amongst African readers, Cape Verde, Mozambique, and Angola, they've circulated there. And I have the impression that you, this is must be very moving for you. Oh, yes, without a doubt. I myself, if you need someone who will make contacts for you as a agent or anything, I'd be happy to go with you. I would like for the three of us to sit under this tree in uh, Paulina's garden, my own story, my personal history, my family history, and the story of the region where I was born and grew up. It is a story where Africa is this mythical place which is present constantly. I think that our trajectory and path is somewhat different from that of our African sisters and brothers who stayed in Africa. Our story and history has, it's made of this process that we call the diaspora. And the culture of the diaspora is very strong here in Bahia. It talks a lot about and says a lot about who we are in Africa became this almost mythical place in our history. Okay, I'm certain that our, of course, today I've read a lot and I understand a lot and a lot of things I look for information. I read African authors and this has contributed to a diversification of what we imagine in terms of the African continent, but even so this Africa, which was invented by us in exile in this process of the diaspora occupies this mythical place in our story. Of course, I also have indigenous ancestry. So I'm mixed one foot in Brazil and another foot in Africa. And in a sense, I imagine myself as part of this place, but also with something which echoes in a different continent from another culture, I believe, yes, Lisa, this meeting has to happen, the three of us, and it would be truly moving in the shade of a tree. Uh, this beautiful meeting with Paulina. You, Paulina, I would imagine, based on what you have said publicly, I've read a lot of Brazilian literature. I don't know if you're familiar with Itamar's work. I would like for you, I don't know if you had the opportunity to read The Crooked Plow and his stories. You, both of you are great storytellers after all, but I believe that it's the first time that you're sitting together in a, a conversation face to face. It's the first time, yes. So I'm gonna do something, uh, so a breach of protocol. Our, we're running out of time, unfortunately. We don't have much time left. I'm gonna ask for Paulina to, for this young, ask a question. Of, a young man who's a lot younger than myself. 
I was born a few years after Paulina, hearing, listening to this young man, what he tells us. What would you like to ask him today, Paulina? I'm not going to ask him anything, nothing. I want to declare that this young man is very wise and he's behaving very well. I'm going to ask him to continue at the same path. He's doing wonderfully. That's amazing because I like to see young people who go for their ideals. So he, without a doubt, is a model who is going to inspire other young people to struggle for a more balanced world with more trees in their books. Have more books in your, more trees in your books calling attention to the need to preserve the environment because human beings are nothing and will be nothing if nature is extinct. So congratulations for your awards and prizes and very soon we'll see each other i don't know how but i'm certain we will itamar actually with these approximations are so unique if you'll allow and i don't know if you would like i know that this is one of the things that we always ask sometimes for the chairperson, not just to be the only source of the questions anything that you would like or message that you would like to send to Paulina, or a question that we'd like to ask her? I would indeed, Lisa. Paulina, I'm asking of a writer who is more mature and wiser with your trajectory crowned by the greatest award in Portuguese language, the Camões Award. This is a, makes us all proud, especially because the relationship that we Brazilians have established with the African countries and we have discovered the wonders of literature in the African continent. Since we're talking about trees and plant species, we could say that trees write and write themselves in space without writing. And we, Pauline, why do we write? I at least believe and I think that we should write to based on our writing and language to create a different world, different from this horrible world we're living in. We write to unveil the hidden wisdom of our peoples, which over the course of the history were silenced, were excluded, and we want to contribute and we have to contribute with our work to better knowledge of each other and build a much more human society without racism, without prejudice and all these horrors of the contemporary world. Every time I write, I dream of this and literature should contribute to a better world amongst human beings between human beings and all nature. Thank you very much, Paulina. Several times we've mentioned, you've mentioned you, Paulina, and Itamar, and we here in Brazil that we are living this nightmare on a daily basis when we hear, Paulina, that in Brazil they've destroyed on average a million and a half trees per day. So ever since FLIP started on Saturday until our meeting, more than four million trees will have, will no longer exist. In 2021, this is almost 500 million trees assassinated. It's the word, the trees that are assassinated and destroyed. You use that word and the UN said that in 2020 in Mozambique and Brazil are amongst the 10 countries with the greatest forest loss in the last decade. Forests that have been burned and felled and don't let life breathe. And since 2020, since the world was struck by the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't breathe, we can't breathe, we can't breathe. 
These are terrifying. This, according to this meeting in Africa, that, and it covers several different countries in Africa. So I would like, unfortunately, we're going to have to adjourn and close this round table. So before I turn the floor over to you, I'd like to read a poem that touched me deeply by Pauline, and it is in the Song of the Enslaved. It's a book of poetry published by Nyanjala here. It's called The Nature Weeps, where you approach Mayombe, which is the name of the forest in Africa. It's the second largest tropical forest, Mayombe is in Amazon, which is, I'm just going to have read the last lines. It's part of, it closes and pulls together our meeting, which unfortunately is coming to an end very soon. I'll read the last part of the verses of this poem by Paulina Shijani. The nature weeps, the tree you're felling comes from the heavens. It's the tree of God. Just as you receive the blessing of life from the Supreme Creator, this tree you're felling brings beauty to your soul. Live with it because it cares for you and for all the birds of the heavens. So on my part, I, and I I'm so sorry that our conversation is coming to an end. I'd like to know if you would like to say some last words to the audience or to each other. What I can say is that we can never give up fighting. Just as we live, we have to fight for there to be a new awareness, human awareness, and learn to live with nature. As I say, nature without us can live and do fine. We are the ones who need nature. So as a writer, we have to continue to work for there to be this awareness. Thank you very much. And Itamar, Nisha, thank you very much. Thank you very much for chairing this meeting that's going to be engraved in my memory. Thank you very much. Paulina, you are loved by Brazilians. You should know that. And we hope that you can visit us very soon to talk about your literature, talk about your writing and the force of your writing. And thank you very much for everything that you've written. Thank you indeed from the bottom of my heart. And I want to thank Flip for holding this meeting here that's so important and uh, organizing this meeting, this Flip, a Flip, which is a historical Flip. I can only thank Flip. So I want to thank you and I as the mediator. I think the honor and joy and emotion is what I'm left with. And if we could now be with you, we would be hugging you. But I think that I have this desire, burning desire to meet you personally, Itamar, who I have ties of friendship and family ties and Itamar, we can take a plane and sit down with her in the shade of her tree there in Maputo, Mozambique. As I said at the beginning, this is an historical flip and I think all of us should adjourn by paying tribute to and dedicating always our own prayers. I'm going to think of this all the time. Paulina, you, I think that have changed the relationship the, with the sacred and spirituality under the shade of a tree, because I'm certain that the tree will listen as we pray. Thank you very much until we see each other soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Eu quero pedir uma coisa,